Hey, I'm Ron Drodos from KeyboardImprov.com and welcome to the 19th in our series of the complete Beatles for piano. This is I'll Follow the Sun. It's a very early song of theirs and I thought we'd do is look at how uh, we would conceptualize a piano version of the Beatles songs because the interesting thing I found about the Beatles and many groups that um, spend a lot of time making their recordings really perfect. You know, they, they did a... Um, this is early, so they didn't do a lot of overdubbing yet on this, but, um, but they still got it right, and it's a really nice, well-thought-out arrangement. If you listen to the drums, for instance, it's not just you know, sort of the typical uh, rock or pop drum beat. It's, it's a very subtle kind of thing that they did intentional. They, they really worked on the sounds. I'm also thinking of groups like Duke Ellington's orchestra, where um, the original recordings have such a wonderful orchestration. So between the Beatles, Duke Ellington, um, groups like that, when we do their music, I think um, sometimes they fall a little flat if we just play the songs. We have to sort of bring something of our own to them um, to make up for what we're not getting from listening to their recording. In the Beatles case, on this recording, I think it's the, the, the beautiful blend in their voices. When, when you play these melodies, even though it's a nice melody, bum, 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 you know, in the back of my mind I'm hearing you know, Paul, George, and, and uh, John harmonizing in that, that very special way that it just makes me feel good, makes me smile. But we're not getting that if you're just playing D, G, E flat, A. So I find um, uh, it's an invitation to really bring something of our own to these songs and, and make them piano versions or if you're in a group, I'll, you know, whatever your group does, bring that out. So um, this is an early song of theirs and when uh, it would have been co considered a ballad by them. You know, when they were uh, just starting out, early 60s, playing at the, the Cavern Club, the, the, the Star Club in Hamburg, and di different restaurants. I knew someone who, who heard them at a restaurant, you know. She actually asked them to turn down. They were too loud. It was in Hamburg. But uh, they weren't well known yet at all, and she said they were really loud. And not that good yet, too. Very sloppy. But they got it together. But, but they would play up-tempo rock and roll. And then when they wanted to play a ballad, they didn't play a ballad like we would have heard in the 40, 30s or 40s, like, you know, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. They didn't play those really slow ballads. They considered it more like a, like a bossa nova or a light pop thing to be a ballad. They used to play Besame Mucho. You know, a nice Latin South American kind of bum on the drums. That would have been considered a ballad for the Beatles. I've, I've, in interviews, I've heard them refer to like that as a ballad. Um, Till There Was You from The Music Man, where they put that Latin feel behind it. Another example. So this is like that. Straight eighth notes, somewhere in between that bossa nova, rumba, cha-cha, and um, uh, uh, moderately tempoed pop music like Under the Boardwalk from, from America from the late 50s, early 60s, somewhere in there. So the chord progression is not particularly rock because the Beatles were also influenced by the standards like uh, uh, those written by Cole Porter, Jerome Kern, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Paul McCartney has said one of his favorite tunes is Cheek to Cheek by Irving Berlin. He sought to emulate that in some of his lyrics that he wrote. So um, uh, this chord progression could have been almost written by a Cole Porter. Um, the genius of the, in that it has two five ones, it, it, it has the minor four chord, which Paul McCartney loved all his, um, ha, has still loves his whole career. Um, the, the unique thing about the Beatles is the genius in how they put it together. And I, I use the word genius maybe in the way that they, they, they were somehow able to transcend the, uh, the traditional cultural norms about what sounds good with what. Um, like for instance, they start on the five chord. The G, it's the five chord. Thinking about, you know, starting a tune on the five chords, a little out of the box, right? And then instead of going to the one after it, like we would have expected maybe a Cole Porter, now, Cole Porter thought out of the box in his own way, right? But traditionally, maybe a lesser composer, might have just gone da, da, to the one chord, resolve five to one, like we always hear we should, right? But the Beatles didn't. They went to the four chord. They went five down to four, right at the beginning of a song. But that four chord isn't just a four chord, it's a dominant seven. 
very evocative, beautiful chords. So God brings a different poignancy to the song. And then it's even in the melody, the tritone. Then it gets bright to the major two, um, just like Duke Ellington or Billy Strayhorn did in Take the A Train, one to the major two. And the song is I'll Follow the Sun. You know, I'm getting this sense of lightness. Um, I'm picturing sunlight sparkling in the water. And you're, you're going to happier times to, uh, um, you know, it's about leaving somebody. And I'm, I'm following the sun, whatever that means. There's not a lot in the lyric. It's a, it's a beautiful lyric, but it doesn't go into a lot of detail about why you're leaving, things like that. But it's about following the sun. And then, then the three chord. One, three. I've been told by people who were uh, teenagers at least, or young adults even, in um, 1963, 64, when they first started hearing the, hearing the Beatles, that the use of the three chord gave it a very fresh sound, because that wasn't really used in um, at least American pop music of the time. It had been used earlier though, Gershwin, Cole Porter, Irving Berlin, that's where the Beatles got it from. And then standard two, five, one, and then the bridge starts on the two, goes to that minor four, back to the one, again, two, minor four, and then at the end of the bridge, they do something that I, I think is just um, stunning. I would have never thought of doing this. Remember, the A section is going to start on the five chord, so most people would have sort of ended the bridge on one and then gone back to five, but the Beatles don't. They end the bridge on the two chord, D minor seven, because that leads to the five. It's like a two-five chord progression, which is the biggest chord progression of the great American songbook and jazz that Paul McCartney grew up playing on, on the piano, family sing-alongs in his living room and such. Um, the two-five-one is so uh, uh, fundamental to that kind of music, but the Beatles have broken it up over sections. They end the bridge with a two, and the A starts with the five. So it's, it's so out of the box, but it sounds wonderful. I, I, I can't explain how they came up with that other than uh, pure inspiration. Um, wonderful, wonderful. The, the, the lyrics are charming, the melody's charming, and the chord progression is charming. So how do we make it charming on the piano without losing all that stuff that the Beatles have on their record? We don't have their beautiful voices, whatever. So um, what I've been doing is just thinking of that, that image of um, sparkling sunlight on the water, you know, what am I going to do? And then I go to the two chord with the, so I'm doing like a C and then a D minor 7 over C, almost like Bach did. Exactly like Bach did <laughs> in his preludes, I'm doing. That, that sparkles to me. So. I'm not gonna, I, I, I don't have a predetermined arrangement, but I'm gonna start out with an intro. I'm not gonna play this intro. It kind of starts with C and then the D minor, but over G and goes F, C. It's nice for a pop record like the Beatles made, but um, for this kind of sparkly thing, um, I'm not sure how long the intro is gonna be. It might just be two measures, it might be four, it might go on longer, but I'm just gonna get a feeling and then go into the tune somehow and then improvise over this at some point, this vamp. Might also improvise over the chords of the song, I'm not sure yet, see how it's going. Uh, if it feels like I can keep that sparkly or um, sort of charming feel, I will. If I feel like it's gonna lose it by improvising over the chord progression at that moment, um, I'll probably just go back to the melody, but let's see how it goes. I'm gonna start uh, by having an image of this uh, sunlight sparkling on, um, on the water. Here we go.
that? Did you hear that? How the, the, those vamps? Kind of like a Keith Jarrett style vamp, right? Just, you know, letting that feeling sort of build. And Elton John's uh, known to do things like that too in concert, like on a song Rocket Man. If you look at live videos, just taking two chords and vamping, vamping over them. So those are some ideas on, first of all, how to understand this chord progression, but also how to personalize Beatles songs in a way that um, I, I think it's, it's meeting the song halfway. It's not trying to recreate what they did on the, did on the record because we're going to lose something by trying that. We don't have the way they played or the way they sound or the way it was produced, which is so embedded in our collective uh, cultural consciousness, right? So in order to not only lose that, we need to bring something to the table. So we're adding something of our own and then we come up with a version that um, hopefully people don't compare to the Beatles. You hear this and, oh, it's a Beatles song and listen to how it's being played. That's our goal. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm just going through one tune just about every week in no particular order. So who knows what's next week. But I appreciate you watching this. Uh, leave a comment with your favorite Beatles song. I'm curious what, what you enjoy listening to. And I'll see you in the next video.